The last video I did about SubQIG was so successful that I've decided to make another one because I got a lot of questions about the complications that are unique to the infusion of this particular therapy, SubQIG. So, request granted. The first infusion complication I'm going to highlight is my infusion site is leaking. So in this case, if you were to say this to me as your infusion nurse, my first three questions would be, what size needles are you using? How many subcutaneous sites do you use? And are all of the sites leaking or is it just one? And just to give a brief recap, subQIG can be infused in one or multiple sites, but we won't talk about that information in this video, but it is here in the first video I did on subQIG. So what can cause leaking at one or all sub-QIG sites is incorrect needle size because there are a range of sizes and gauges. Needle gauge refers to the size of the hole in the needle. The gauge represented by the letter G as you see in this example is kind of inversely proportional because the higher the gauge number, the smaller the opening of the, the sub-Q needles. Uh, and they're typically either 26 or 24 gauge, so they're fairly small needles, as these are the gauges of butterfly needles. And the length refers to exactly that, the length of the needle, and some needles come in inches. However, sub-Q needles are referred to in millimeters, and they typically range from four millimeters to 14 millimeters. Normally, it's suggested that we use six millimeter needles in length, for children and in adults, nine to 12 millimeter needles for the average weight adult. So in the event a patient's site is leaking, it tells me a few things. One being that the needle isn't long enough possibly because our subcutaneous skin layer is the deepest layer of skin with the epidermis and the dermis sitting above it. So the needle has to be long enough to reach well into this layer. Otherwise there can be a backflow of fluid. Also keep in mind that everyone's skin is different. Some may have tougher, thicker epidermis due to sun exposure or a condition like dermatomyositis, making needle insertion more difficult and the tissue may not be as receptive to the absorption of a subcutaneous type medication. So in this case, I'd want to determine whether the needle size is appropriate or maybe that person has gained or lost weight indicating a change in needle size might be warranted. The other potential cause of a leaking sub-QIG infusion site is improper needle placement or site selection. So there are several options for site selection for sub-Q infusions, but most people choose their abdomen because it's the easiest to access. However, if a needle is placed too far in one direction or the other, or maybe on the perimeter, or even in an area of the body like the thighs or backside, this can increase the risk of the needle becoming dislodged or not seated in the subcutaneous tissue properly. And finally, I'd also want to know how much fluid is being infused into each site. Infusing more fluid than is appropriate for a single site can lead to poor absorption and leaking. The rule of thumb is 20 milliliters per site, so anything over that can lead to this issue. Also, subcutaneous needles need to be positioned two inches apart if multiple sites are being used. Anything closer and fluid absorption can be affected and overwhelm the area. So remember, the more sites you use, the less amount of fluid at each site and the more comfortable you may be as a whole. Next complication is local skin irritations like redness, swelling, and itching. Normally with sub-QIG, skin reactions are mild and typically related to the volume of fluid being infused. So they'll normally dissipate and improve as fluid is absorbed over about 48 hours, give or take. If, however, there's more swelling than expected or it's taking longer than normal to absorb, we can consider the following. You can decrease the volume per site and or increase the infusion time. Also making sure the needle size is appropriate and changing it if necessary, as we discussed earlier. Also asking if you're allergic to the tape or the dressing and changing that to a paper or a hypoallergenic tape. Ensuring that the needle is dry when you insert it into your skin as medicine on the tip of the needle 
can sometimes cause a skin reaction. This is called dry priming, and your nurse will teach you how to dry prime your needle as part of your education. Also practicing and perfecting your technique for priming the tubing and placing and removing the needle. The better you are at this, the less local trauma is caused to the area. Then we can also have you try using a gentle massage or a warm or cold compress according to your preference after your infusion. And lastly, you can try applying a steroid cream to the infusion site during and after your infusion. If you're having what seems like intense itching or you're breaking out in hives, this could be a sign of anaphylaxis, which is a more serious reaction in which the infusion should be stopped immediately and emergency medical help needs to be obtained right away. The third complication is discomfort with the needle. Now, earlier we spoke about the problems that arise when the needle is too short, but this next complication can actually be if the needle is too long and potentially hitting the abdominal wall or the muscle, necessitating the switch to a shorter or another type of needle altogether. There are some different features of needles, some, some of which include a, a back cut needle tip, which minimizes damage and scarring and local site reactions. And maybe using a needle which allows the steel needle, or what we call an introducer, to be removed and just leaves the flexible catheter in its place. But ultimately, if one brand is causing issues, we can try switching it. And then you can consider also applying a topical anesthetic like Emla before you insert the needle or even just icing the area prior to insertion. The next complaint is my infusion is taking way longer than it normally does. And this is potentially due to inappropriate volume per site or the rate of infusion and or the number of sites being used. We'd also want to check your equipment for pump settings to make sure they weren't changed in error and that you're using the correct tubing size and length to match the infusion rates. We also want to check pump function, of course, and battery function. It's a very good idea to use new batteries with each infusion, depending on the pump you're using. So if this is an ongoing issue, we'd also like to arrange usually a time to come and visit and just observe your technique. So never hesitate to call your pharmacy that's supplying the medication or even reach out to the nurse who did your initial teaching visits. We're always, always happy to help. And then the fifth and final complication is I have blood in my infusion tubing. And if this occurs during initial needle insertion, then it typically indicates that the needle was inadvertently inserted directly into a blood vessel and will need to be removed, discarded, and restarted with a new setup. If the blood is noted after needle removal, then this is expected and holding pressure on the site for a few minutes should suffice. In general, it's also important to rotate infusion site areas and to make sure that during needle insertion and sub-Q IG prep, that your area is also free of any clutter and clean. There's so much that goes into choosing between IVIG and sub-Q IG that it's impossible to cover it all in one video, but I did make another video about the pros and cons of each therapy right here.